Ralph here once again, and what we are looking at is a heat map. Now, those unfamiliar, every weekend at about Saturday or Sunday morning, like it is right now, we review data analytics from a different perspective as opposed to what you see on these scary charts of the news, so you better understand it. What we're looking at is basically what's known as a heat map. A heat map through a program called Seaborne. A one, for example, for those unfamiliar with correlation, means we have a perfect relationship. Let's say, for example, stringency index relates to stringency index. Being age 70 or older as a 0.9 means a pretty strong relationship has to do with mean and age. Now we are going to be looking at more along the lines of cases per million, deaths per million, new death smooth per million in reference to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, however you like to relate to it. But keep this in the back of your mind for a little bit in reference to the uh, this heat map index in what may or may not relate to increased cases of mortality or positive cases. It's going to be important and you'll it'll all come together in a few minutes. But we're going to speed right along with our first really groundbreaking article in reference to a medication called Malnupiravir. 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 Please forgive me if I mispronounced that. But otherwise, we'll just call it MK4482. This is a major breakthrough for primary reason as follows. And again, links will be there for you to research on your own. Because the drug can be taken by mouth, treatment can be started early for a potentially threefold benefit. Inhibit patients' progress to severe disease. Shorten the infectious phase to ease the emotional and socioeconomic toll of prolonged patient isolation. And rapidly silence local outbreaks. Primarily, the reason why is basically this drug, Molnupiravir, MK4482, completely suppresses virus transmission within 24 hours. That coming out of Georgia State University, again, I'll have the link for you. I don't want to add up something called publisher bias to it, but the word game changing is amazing. Imagine less time in quarantine, less ability to transmit a disease for healthcare workers. If you have zero transmission and you're taking the medication, you have a very solid solution which can offset the need potentially for vaccination. Again, groundbreaking. Should be headline news. But you hear it here. The link will be there for you to follow on your own and you can validate exactly what I'm trying to impress on you. All right, next. Research reveals how airflow inside a car may affect COVID-19 transmission risk. Sounds superfluous. However, though, there's an extremely important part, as we discussed before, in reference to correlation. What I'm noticing in correlation, as testing goes up, more cases are being discovered. But first, let's read the paragraph. Driving around with windows up and air conditioning or heat on is definitely the worst scenario, according to our computer simulations. Um, blah, blah, blah. The best scenario we found was having all four windows open. What we're trying to get at is you can pull the virus into your ventilation system or it comes through the window itself. You don't have to even have an infected individual inside the car. Why is that important? Well, it's important for the following reason. This. What... The hypothesis I'm trying to proceed forward to is that these long COVID-19 testing sites, you see part of the problem here? You see a confounding possibility that can cause additional transmission of the virus? Do you see a major flaw in these testing sites by looking at this picture? Now remember, how long can COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 be airborne? Well, according to the physics, this came out November 23rd, 2020. It is many times longer. This is what looking at. They were looking at data from a century old finding, but a hundred times longer than the original studies suggest. So going back to here, including you have formite formation, dry droplets also pose a serious risks. And it can basically last even longer than the droplets itself and can affect large numbers of people if the virus remains potent. So you can have the virus itself be airborne in an area, and especially with poor circulation, 
like something like this, you have individuals literally driving into what can be a SARS-CoV-2 cloud. And as they're rolling down the windows and they're getting tested, I guarantee if you test the surfaces inside these areas, like for example, it was done before and other uh, testing in reference to, we discussed in reference to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 with a 100% positivity rate on the floor. Can you imagine doing this for hours in an un or poorly ventilated warehouse? The chance of transmission between the individuals, of the virus itself aerosolized entering the car, then not only entering the car, the virus itself begins to dry on the surfaces of inside the car. So if you're not driving with gloves on 24-7 and so forth, so far and so forth, the seats, cotton, you name it, even the mask itself. People don't realize cloth masks can hold the virus for quite some time. So basically what I'm trying to say is you have a testing center, you're also creating potentially a transmission center. And I'm not talking automotive. Now, this is interesting because I'm spending a little bit more time on it than I maybe I should, because a while ago, now this is kind of comparing apples and oranges, but I want to give you an idea where you could find bacteria or viruses which you may never be thinking of. This happened back a while ago in 2014 when we're looking at Legionnaire's disease. Windshield washer fluid was isolated from nearly 75% of school buses tested in one district. This was Arizona. Now, the interesting part about this, you think about transmission. Although windshield washer fluid is not normally associated with spreading disease, uh, the project was begun after a series of epidemiological studies found motor vehicle use to be associated with an increased risk for Legionnaire's disease. One such study attributed nearly 20% of Legionnaire's disease cases in the United Kingdom, not associated with hospital outbreaks, to be automobile windshield washer fluid. Now again, comparing bacteria to viruses, but it gives you an idea that the viruses and bacteria can take hold in areas which you normally would not expect. And henceforth, unless there's some sort of giant fans blown out of here or whatever it is, that site or testing sites can definitely play a role where the more people being tested, the higher number of positivity cases. And we're not even talking cross-contamination of swabs and things like that, which could be give the impression of asymptomatic cases, when in reality, it's contaminated goods. But to proceed as follows, into this food for thought, think about that as we go through the studies with no correlation in reference to anything else or being mitigated by masks or things along those lines. Driving testing centers is rapid test albeit with good intention, could be having very detrimental effects because you're actually pulling people into testing facilities which could be highly contaminated, potentially. Until tests are conducted, it's only hypothetical. But to proceed as follows. All right, so next, incredible, incredible boom for food again. Chemical compounds in food can inhibit key SARS-CoV-2 enzyme. Now this one's called Empro. But know what does it? Now, I want you to think about this for a second, too. I'm going to cover the article in a second. It is green tea. Now, I want you to look at it from an epidemiological standpoint as far as cultural. Green tea has five tested chemical compounds that bind to different sites in the pocket on the MPRO, essentially overwhelming it to inhibit its function. So think about this. Asia, where basically sars cov 2 seem to not have the same impact it's having here currently. So look at the diet, honeysuckle. Honeysuckle contains MIR2911, which basically has been shown to not only work with Ebola, but also, of course, to be a strong inhibitory infection, microRNA, in reference to SARS-CoV-2. Lychee berry, because the quercetin and hesperitin. Obviously, the green tea. High mushroom intake, shiitake, mataki mushrooms, high beta-glucan or glucan content. Not only that, as well as vitamin D, which vitamin D has been shown to reduce transmission rate by 57%. And according, also cultural things, not looking at the mask, but certain things since basically uh, SARS-CoV-2 is found to be pronounced on floors 
taking shoes off before entering the house so you're not basically spreading it around. So if you look at it from an epidemiological standpoint, and a lot of the cultural behaviors as well as dietary functions, not even to talk about fermented foods and the positive bacteria intake, those can end up building a firewall against this particular virus where we don't do a lot of that in basically Western areas such as the United States itself. Food for thought, no pun intended. Let's go into the full study itself where it says, conclusion, both docking simulation, and you hear that a lot with docking, in vitro assay showed that catechin 3 ogallate, epi, epi catechin 3 ogallate, da da da, gallocatechin, da da da, epi gallocatechin, gallocatechin, pro cyanidins, da da da, b1, b2, da da, and pro activity of SARS CoV2. More of these compound rich extracts are green tea, muscadine grape, cacao, and dark chocolate. Now, I didn't focus on that, I wanted to focus more on the green tea since that was the winner. Uh, inhibited and pro activity. Watch everyone start like eating tons of, you know, cocoa and dark chocolate this winter. Given there is not an effective medicine for treatment of COVID-19 and not a vaccine prevented against the SARS-CoV-2 infection at the time of this article, which was last week, and transmission, this data recommend that these nutraceutical compounds and extracts of green tea, grape, cacao can be utilized to interfere the devastation of SARS-CoV-2. Really positive. Think from a cultural aspect. A lot of the foods which are being discovered to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 or bust up the RNA and so on and so forth are very, very common in Asian culture and part of the daily dietary intake, where for the United States, uh, not so much, especially with a lot of restaurants and things like that closing. The ability to eat healthy has been diminished. People being indoors, not exercising, vitamin D levels tend to go down, wintertime, less sunshine, so on and so forth. You see where we're heading. And that brings us to the next article. All right. This is from the British Medical Journal. Not some guy like me just making up stuff on YouTube. Rethink COVID-19 infection control to keep primary schools open this winter. They bring up a really interesting point. That's because young children get between four and eight respiratory infections every winter. Let's just go to the next page. All right. And they could overlap with those COVID-19. And it makes it difficult to test or, or takes a while to get results. Young children will inevitably miss significant quantities of schooling this winter. This is their recommendations. I'm just reading from the British Medical Journal. I find it so intriguing how we choose which scientists to listen to and which ones not to. And let me bring up that my favorite YouTube part. Do you all remember this? days that we had of mitigation clearly have had an effect although it's Remember this? to quantitate it because of those March two 31st forces but the reason why we feel so strongly about the necessity of the additional 30 days is that now is the time whenever you're having an effect not to take your foot off the accelerator and on the brake, but to just press it down on the accelerator. And that's what I hope and I know that we can do over the next 30 days. All right. So you get this. So Dr. Fauci, coronavirus, my uh, mitigation is actually working. So that was the 15, was it 15 days again? But the reason why we feel so strongly clearly have had an effect, although it's tied right. to that, is mitigation. Now, the 15 days that we had of mitigation clearly have had an effect although it's tough to what's the date of this march 31st 2020 and now it seems like they want to mitigate forever so you can either listen to basically individuals which may be well intentioned or basically you can look at the individuals which are actually paying attention to the data on a daily basis such as the british medical journal no compulsory face coverings for young children. No requirements for entire bubbles to isolate following a single case at school. No requirement for the entire family to isolate while awaiting the child's test results. Why? Because with four to eight respiratory infections every winter per child, you can see where this is heading from a logistical standpoint. And not only that, devastating to their education and future. So you can listen to the individuals who've had it wrong at every corner, or you can start listening to individuals like epidemiologists, data scientists, people that do not have a vested political or celebrity status um, motivation. That's the easiest way to describe it. 
So now let's go right into the data analysis, and I'm trying to be nice. I respect the doctors and medical professionals working on this, but seriously, they've been getting it wrong at every corner, and they're not paying attention to the data, and that's what we're going to get to next. Bum, ba, ba. Here we are. Heat map. Remember, 1-1. One, one. So this is a world heat map. So you look at total cases per million. In order to have start having a solid correlation, that's, yeah, that's 0.063. If it was 0.63 like this, 0.65, that have more of a correlation. So total cases per million have a, a correlation basically with um, new deaths smooth per million. All right, so that's obvious. Certain things, for example, like population have a negative correlation, which is real interesting, meaning it actually has an opposite effect. But if you look at this, and we'll get back to this in a second, closer to one, stronger correlation. And this is the color. So things like this area, GDP per capita, has, an, has a correlation with the Human Development Index, uh, and so on and so forth. But look at this. We're really not having any correlation with anything outside the obvious. But let's get to something a little bit more, um, how would you describe it, tangible. All right, here we go. And let's see this one I'm looking for. I think here we are, please. All right, remember this. This is interesting. This was California. The one thing we were able to find a correlation with, and this is where it goes back to testing facilities. Total test results seem to basically correlate very strongly with death. And that is an interesting aspect. So much so, for example, the correlation is a 0.98. Remember we discussed a 1 is a perfect correlation? A 0.98. And where a death increase is poorly correlated with positive increase. And here's our numbers right there. And what we're going to do is go down the list right here because it's the most recent data we looked at last week. And also, too, for the data analysts out there, I will do something on my other YouTube channel in reference to how do we smooth these curves out and so on and so forth. But for the average person watching this, ah. So basically, this is an ICU currently because we're talking about ICU rates and obviously California is going ballistic because they're worried about the hospital beds reaching mass maximum capacity in ICU at least. So yeah, uh, we're about the same level as we were in August. So all the mitigation and lockdowns and so on and so forth, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, lockdowns work and then when they don't work, say we're you, know, you can't have it both ways. All right, proceed. All right, so we go to positive increases, the date. Uh, let's get something you can read here. Total result increase, the positive increase. All right, you see this data right here? This is how you can, this is how you can uh, manipulate or massage a chart. For example, if I show you the chart this way, all right, this is the red is the total, uh, is the total test result increase. And this is the positive increase. This makes it look pretty superfluous. Like, for example, well, I'm not seeing much. But however, let's say I put an axis on this side and I put an axis on this side. This is for the individual not experienced with data science. All right, well, let's go back. Let's scroll down a little bit. Da, da, da. All right, now you get this, this different look, this mortality to positive increase. So here you have the positive increase being in purple in the mortality. But you see how the, the separation right there? So you have about 20,000 cases or close to that uh, in basically the positive uh, increase in purple. And you have about 120 deaths. So you see how that works there? But if I show you this chart, which is the positive increase, the total test results increase, how it doesn't look as dramatic See how it depends on how the news and the media present the information. Even though we're both we're representing the exact same data between here and there, they have a very different impact in motivating the viewer to proceed down. All right, this is all the correlation stuff. Don't worry about that. Ba ba ba. Giant heat map. Don't pay attention to that because that's going to make you go blind. All right, the correlation between total test results and basically death is so strong that we can make a predictive model even. All right, let's say for example here. If I was to run this, let's say, because I ran this prior, let's say we're at 290,000 tests. What's California at right now? 
All right, California is at 19,791 deaths as of December 5th. All right, so you got that right there. So the, it is so solid, the correlation, and that's out of uh, 249,000 tests. We can predict exactly the range of death that's going to that's going to end up uh, being. So for example, let's say, let's go to 255, or sorry, not 255, it's 24 million. Let's say 25 million, 500,000 tests. What? Uh, da, 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 25, 1, 2, 3, yeah. And this is how many, unfortunately, not to belittle it, uh, the mortality that can be expected. Between 20,266 and 22,503. So you have something to work with. It's probably easier for me to predict mortality rates based upon the number of tests because right now, with that correlation being as strong as it is, that you could almost, like, if you were to make a, set, a murder mystery, you could almost say the tests are resulting in higher mortality. Uh, but that's how strong the correlation is. So I can gauge the mortality. Let's see, what, what are we at right now anyways? So we're at a mortality rate of, did I have it down here? Let's see. Well, there it is. So at uh, 24,901,975. So let's say I make this total test down to 25 million. All right, just give an example again. We're going to run through this real fast, so please bear with me. So let's just make it 25 million to give you something uh, easier to understand. And here goes our estimator. So between 19,868 and 22,132, by the time that we turn the corner on exactly a quarter million tests. You see what we're looking at right there? That's what that's how we gauge it. And that's just by using the weirdest thing, the number of tests. Now we go back to think about those drive throughs, people driving through potential clouds, the SARS C O V two or infected testing sites. Uh, just to keep in mind, this is a story as I'm scrolling down. A long time ago, Doctors Without Borders was trying to figure out why polio was spreading so well, you know, rapidly. And a large part of the world, they found out that they were reusing the exact same syringes over and over. So sometimes it requires thinking out of the box to say, hey, maybe the polio didn't become more mutagenic or easier to transmit. Maybe we're doing something wrong. We're actually inviting people into a cloud of SARS-CoV-2 into enclosed garage centers in order to do testing when people have to wait for hours and with clouds that can stay uh, airborne for hours as well in the worst case scenarios as well. Those dry droplets end up on solid surfaces and you can see the whole cycle beginning. I mean, bottom line, if you could, in the way the American, uh, way the physics labs did it, is they said, if you could smell perfume, uh, for example, from 10 feet away, then the virus can travel well. Now imagine a skunk. You could drive down the road. You could be 300 yards down the road or even you could be up the road and you could smell the skunk. Well, that's, that's spent, that scent has to travel on something. Think about that. All right. So there's our correlation, creepy correlation, creepy correlation. There's the stuff that's going to bore you to death. So I'm not going to do that. Boring, 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 boring. Yeah. Going blind. Da, da, da. All right. Here we go. Now, this is a correlation. This is a heat map. And just for fun, I made the heat maps random. So let's just try a new one just for fun. And that looks exact. Nope, that's not right. That's Mako. All right, so this is the United States. That was embarrassing. So positive to population, you have a pretty strong correlation for the United States itself. And so total test results to positive, 0.9. Which is interesting because you have to remember total test results doesn't mean they're all being positive. A lot of them have to be negative, but you can actually that's what I did with the that's what I did with the math. I gauged my math according to the number of tests, since that tends to be a really solid correlation. Let's see what results in death correlation population. Uh, pretty solid for the United States. 0.8 positives, obviously total test results 0.8 overall. Hospitalized currently not so much. Remember looking at the color spectrum here. Death to death, it's one. Positive increase, not so much. Total test results increase, not so much. Death increase, obviously we have something there, but not there necessarily. Percent positive, 
uh, uh, positive increase per million and test increase per thousand, that's pretty low down the line. It could be some sort of mathematical anomaly. And for example, in its ICU currently, pretty heavily with the population. Now keep this in mind when we go to look at the world because this is really something fairly unique to the United States. Hospitalized currently to be in an ICU, uh, strong correlation. It doesn't mean everyone that goes to the hospital. Uh, it could be like a five to one ratio, but you have a correlation. You can gauge one by the other in the US, not the rest of the world. All right, now we're gonna go to this crazy thing. Don't pay attention to that. This is what we're looking for mathematically. This is correlation between the total test results, again, and the death. That is a really bizarre anomaly. How do you do that? And so, for example, to get to that strong a correlation. And what we're going to look do is look at just a few of the primary states, Alabama, Oklahoma, North Carolina. All right. So here we go. Look Now, Alabama, of course, the most bizarre correlation 0.9979 that's freaky all right and just for fun let's just bring up a brand new uh heat map there it is that's boring but let's see if there's anything more exciting for you for alabama and uh, there's a little bit more color all right so look at the, the correlations here all right so positive to death total test results of death so you have a solid correlation and I would not expect ones, all right? Uh, so basically, unless it's like hospitalized currently to hospitalized currently, you have a, a one correlation, obviously. A uh, lot of things that don't necessarily do it, but for the for expediency, I'll, you can always freeze it. I'll look at it later on. And that's a describe function and so on and so forth. All right, and here we go to Al Alabama, looking at all the data, cases per million test per thousand. You see how they relate? Alabama, positive increase, the hospitalized currently. Keep in mind, we're dealing with two axes here. Look but look how much they relate. Think about testing inside warehouses. Total deaths, total tests, that is unusual. And then we go to positive increase, the death increase, unusual. Uh, if you look at it as a whole, I mean, it's correlation, but doesn't really show me much of a breakthrough in medical treatment. Mortality percentage per positive. Now, we're not talking hospitalization. All right, there's your percentage mortality going down pretty dramatically. And there is our, another correlation chart. Prettier color. All right, now let's go to the next one. We are going to be looking at Oklahoma. Test per thousand, cases per million. Interesting correlation. Again, remember we're dealing with a different type of access. So keep in mind the numbers are not going to be the same for each one. So purple is there and red is there. You see that major spike there when they decided to do a lot of testing. All right, make sure Oklahoma. You see how they, the positive increase to hospitalization currently. Really freaky uh, correlations. This one's still very freaky. This is number two in our number correlation spot. Uh, positive increase to death increase. Mortality percentage to positive increase. Mortality increase to positive increase. Pretty low. Uh, overall, I have no clue how they were at a zero, and all of a sudden they just started skyrocketing. Maybe they started data collecting at that time. Here is our basically our heat map. Test results the positives. Test results the test results one. Test results to death, it must be rounding, one. Again, you could use the test results to correlate and predict the death rate. That is just befuddling. Again, I always respect your hypothesis in reference to this, uh, but that's amazing. Again, looking at the colors here, there's your correlation. All right, North Carolina, next one. Let's speed through. If we see anything interesting, we'll stop. Freaky correlation, again, the test results, the total deaths. Uh, yep, got that. Mortality increase to positive increase. It was going down. See, that's really weird. It was going down, went up, 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 and then down, 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 down. So that's an unusual spike considering the fact that there's no mutations or antigenic drift. Here's our heat map. 
this actually looks like a heat map. All right, positive to positive, obviously. Uh, positive to total test results, positive to death, total test results. Again, similar results for the exact, for these particular states. All right, now let's go to California. All right, we're in a lockdown quarantine here in California, and that's where I'm recording this video from. There we go. California, this is a positive increase, the hospitalized currently. Again, if you look at these people all lined in cars and parking lots, just let your imagination run wild. Correlation, again, California wasn't even the highest correlation, but that's what caught my eye the first time. And then we go to, what is it? so we're looking, red is the positive increase, death increase, and then mortality percentages. Again, we had a little bit of an edge there, and then all of a sudden, look at that. We're heading towards and I hate to say it because it's so bemoaned during the whole pandemic thing when we tried to flatten the curve back in April and May and June. Oh, it's not the flu. It's not the flu. It's worse. Well, that's interesting. So just keep that in mind. All right, heat map. Nice color blue. All right, total test results. We're at a 0.99 positive to death. Remember, we looked at it before, 0.98 to 0.99. Interesting. And then to just round it out, New York, which has an interesting pattern. And that's the pattern that I find interesting. It's like on its way out, all the states need to be uh, mimicking each other. The total deaths to total tests. Not as strong a correlation as the other states, but you can see that ebb and flow. And there we go to positive increase to death increase. Interesting correlation. But the mortality of the positive increase, mortality percentage, the positive increase percentage, it's that's pretty low consistently for the entire state overall. And then New York and their heat map. And there we go. Look at total test results to death. It's still, it's 0.96. That's just weird. And so you look at everything else. Uh, positive increase per million, so on and so forth. Uh, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic. Now, when we look at the rest of the world in a second, uh, it's going to be interesting. But let's go back to mask use first. You ready? So let's go to masks. And we're going to go to the top real fast. Do, 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 to save time. And, all right, here we go. So I'm going to scroll down down don't pay attention to that this is up to date I believe it is yeah so up to date on our mask information and here we go and therefore now we're looking at states states or countries that have remember zero Nicaragua Monaco Solomon Islands Sweden Palestine and Vanuatu uh, basically have no policy in reference to mask so Sweden's always been our control one is recommended Japan is back down to one. We'll show that in a second. Two required in some areas. For example, people think United Kingdom's at a four in their mind, but in Australia's at a four, but no, it's only at a two. United States. Yeah, and people like us, you know, we are at a four, but now obviously not every single state is at a four. So let us begin. Look in the area right there. You get an area of average states, and then a lot of countries we think would be at a four are actually at a three. So... That's our chart right there. Let us begin. The United States, and that is our mask level, is our correlation. Now, look at the math. One minus. The reason being is because we're not trying to imply that face masks cause COVID-19. We're trying to see if it prevents. So our correlation, no. Uh, weakly correlated, if as a stretch that masks have anything to do and remember, it's a lot of confounding when looking at one factor. So I'm trying to be the devil's advocate at the same time. But however, though, a 0.43, no. Um, mass level again, cases per million, a correlation. Did I do that one? Did I do a 1 minus? Yeah, 0.35. Can't say, remember, each state is different. Florida and places like that don't have they have mask mandates. So in you know our world and data, list the United States as a 4. Uh, it's, it's a weak. It's a weak foundation to build upon, but you can get an idea. We work with what we got. All right, United States, tests per 1,000 uh, to cases per million. 
Yeah, that's a strong correlation. Remember, I learned this from Oxford University when they did their OWA data. I couldn't figure out why they did tests per thousand to cases per million, but it, it, it graphs well as far as basic predictability and estimations. All right, Sweden, no mask policy, a little bit of increase, uh, no mask policy. All right, we have more, we had all of a sudden we started having rise in cases per million, so close to 500 cases per million. But keep in mind though, on an apple to apple basis, Sweden to the United States, Sweden did nothing. And right now they're pretty close to the United States and the United States is doing a lot. So they're taking their tax base and tax revenue and investing in better hospitals, but we're losing our tax base and tax revenue and just trying to keep people locked indoors. Food for thought. Uh, test per thousands, Columbia. Their mass went up to four. They went down. Didn't see any much of a difference. Same. Mass level to make a difference. But it does make a difference. Test per thousand, cases per million. Interesting dance it does there, right? Japan. People think, oh, they must have mask mandates because we have this bias in our head. A lot of people do wear masks naturally, but guess what? Social distancing and things like that. You ever see the subways? Uh, they try, but in fact, it's even, even more interesting. If you read Japan, they're actually encouraging people to travel on the airlines. They're actually giving um, subsidies for people to fly from one place to the next so they can keep their uh, domestic air travel up, to, up, and, uh, up and going. So they're actually encouraging travel where we're actually discouraging travel here in the United States. Look it up. You'll find it's just fascinating. All right, and then Japan, mass level. I don't know what happened here. They went up to like a three. Then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, went back down to a one. Uh, obviously, the typical test per thousand, case per million. And then we go to New Zealand. You don't hear much about it. Mass level is a one. It's New Zealand. Not much. Uh, probably the most honest testing I've seen because you don't have that weird rise thing and it's pretty steady all across the board. I don't know what makes New Zealand tests so different than everyone else tests but they don't have that dance going on per se. Finland, remember they had a little bit of panic there? They went to a mass level of one. They may have had some impact there, I don't know. Looks like not really but one's really not a mask mandate. Uh, but look where it is, tests per thousand, cases per million. Look at the relationship. India, mass level four. Now, you remember, you got to enforce it. So enforcement could be challenging. India again, mass level, da-da-da, da-da, so on and so forth. Spain, remember, they had big problems. I'm just running through. The mass mandate that went back up to a four just recently, it looks like. Uh, but it looks like it has more to do with cases per million than tests per thousand. France, they're having some economic uh, political upheaval, I should say. They've always had it for a little while now. And so the mass level going up and the cases per million. The only thing that seems to be any correlation is between testing and cases. And look at that. Look how interesting that flows. United Kingdom, again, people think they're at a four on the mass level, but they're only at a two. Uh, their cases started going up. And then what did they stop on December 2nd? Interestingly enough, they stopped a lot of the quarantines and lockdowns. Look at this. Test per thousand, case per million. Same dance. Italy, which I worried about. Four went down to a three. They still went up in case per million. Test per thousand, cases per million. What an incredible relationship. And, of course, we'll get past that there. All right, let's see what we have here. States. All right, I'm just going to, because we're so short on time right now. This is basically, you know, South Dakota. I'm running down because remember, like, they bounce all, I should just be smoothing this. I didn't smooth it yet. And then I always want to get to more pertinent information. Uh, death increase per ton, da, 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 death increase per 100,000. Remember, Florida decided to end the lockdown back in about November. Actually, I think late October. Uh do you see much of a difference between New York and California? Again, when looking at correlations, think about that. What we're doing is really not doing much. If you have a control such as Florida, which is doing very little, and you have New York and California, which are basically maniacal, some sort of Machiavellian dark dream, and you have Florida, which is having people actually travel to it for vacations, 
and look. That's the information you have at hand. All right, and then this is your deaths cumulative, so on and so forth, da da da. All the way down the line, positive increases per state. California began mass testing, and look at this. California is way up there. All right, next one, due to hardships, we're not going to do because they didn't update their data yet. Every six weeks they do. Scandinavian countries. All right, we go back to the top here. We want to look basically what's happened here. We have Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. That's why I called the Fauci list. All right, looking at the information there, U.S. and Sweden, pretty close to reference to cases per million. But again, Sweden did nothing. So the nothing strategy is still beating the something strategy. Does that make any sense? Unless you consider nothing a strategy. Uh, let's see Sweden again. New death smooth per million. Let's see Sweden was on the rise there. We have to be honest in reference to our data. And cases per million. Looking at Denmark, Finland, uh, Iceland, Norway. Remember, Iceland was all of a sudden picking up, and also now Iceland's like down. All right, then we go cases smooth per million, started September 1st, 2020. Here again, here you have Sweden and United States. And I know people like are rooting for Sweden to fall apart, but again, because they're not doing anything, so it's like making people angry in the back of their head. It's like someone walking into a Walmart without a mask, and we're like going, ah, we got to get them. And But you know what? That's not science. That's 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 rivalry, and so we've actually made it a rivalry for countries that did little, so we look for them to fall, and so we can confirm that we're doing is right. So we feel better about ourselves when others basically don't do as well. Does that make any sense? All right, so there we go. There, uh, death smooth per million, but it's not what you think. Interesting thing happened when we look at the actual graph charts. Here's the United States starting September 1st, new death smooth per million. Sweden was catching up, and that's actually our number, but now we're going to go to correlations. This is what we started at. This is the world. Freeze this if you want. Let's just get a little bit of a rundown so we get a new chart here. And wow, that's bright. Let's keep that one. All right, freeze that one if you want to. Look to see if you can find your correlations. All right, between stringency index, extreme poverty, or any, whatever it is, and like human development index, for example, if you if you go down here, uh, obviously plays a role with life. Now, that's gonna be tough for you to read. Let me just hit this a little again, one more time. So obviously, human development index has a better impact with um, with life expectancy. And so, but how about new deaths smooth per million? No correlation. Now, our little correlation total deaths. I mean, as far as weak between the two. Per million, do we have anything that correlates strongly? Uh, 0 0.52, 0 0.79, that's cases per million, correlates with deaths per million, that makes sense. 0 0.7, let's see, no. Now let's take things out, for example, let's say female smokers. It correlates with uh, median age weekly. Anything else? <laughs> so, so with the world, Female smoking uh, correlates with being 70 or older. So again, data is not about being popular or doing the politically correct thing. Data is data. Could it be other confounding factors? Yeah, probably. Let's let's look at diabetes. Diabetes, da, da, da. extreme poverty. This is interesting. Extreme poverty with deaths, cases per million. Now, obviously, because there's not as much testing, actually has a negative correlation. In fact, it has a pretty solid negative correlation, obviously, with life expectancy and things like that. But at the same time, too, has a pretty negative correlation with deaths per million and cases per million, probably because of lack of testing. Uh, let's see. Does total cases per million have a strong correlation with anything? Uh, female smokers, once again, oddly. I uh, Remember, this is 0.063. Deaths per million, we're already on cases per million. We know uh, deaths. Uh, population base, population density, no. Human development index, really no solid correlation. But I'll leave that up for you to check a little bit later on if you want to freeze it. All right, so let's go down the line here. Overall case mortality, life expectancy. Again, the United States is way down here. We should start from the right here, and or my right, and go down this way as far as the longest life expectancy. So we life, we're, we're right above Cuba. And then the current case mortality, that's right now, that's for our correlation. Uh, population density, that's at the beginning of the pandemic. Current case mortality, uh, 
Population density has very little to do with it. This is just looking at it from a diff different visual aspect. I'm going to scroll down this one real fast. Case per million, da da da. All right, now let's see new deaths per million. Where did the United States go? All right, so these are all the countries that are supposed to be doing better than the United States. The United States is at a 6.53 deaths per million now. That's freaking insane. So remember when we started doing these graphs, we're at like two point something. So let's go to new deaths per million. Let's change that number to 6.54. I'll just leave it at 6.55. Ready? Here we go. These are all the countries doing better than the United States in reference to deaths per million. So United Kingdom, Air, France, Sweden. So basically, whoa. So all these countries, you know, provided there's technical aspects or whatever, are doing better than the United States in reference to death per million. Even Mexico, which is I'm surprised because Mexico had a major outbreak and I thought they would have a higher death per million, but they don't. The United States is pretty much one of the top there. And there's all the other countries, data-wise. All right, now we are going to go to... I'm going to, I'm going to bypass the Monte Carlo thing. Let's go... What's the COVID data focus? All right, look up here. All right, this is the hospital. This is the... I'm going to go backwards here for speed. Hospital increase, death increase. Scary, scary, scary. Basically, yeah. Positive death percentages going down, which is good. Positive hospitalization percentages, it's going down slowly on the slope. And all right, for expediency, uh, this happened right before the election. Uh, hospitalization increase, the positive increase, that's the real numbers that you don't see truly in the news. It doesn't look as dramatic that way, but this is always what disturbed me. But now let's, let's begin to round this whole thing off with the world data. All right, here we go. Let's speed it up to the top. World data, new cases smooth per million to new deaths smooth per million. We're looking at the entire globe. Slight rise, maybe. Mortality percentage of positive cases. You have a little bit of rise. Interesting, because you notice that with that little slope, that valley going. But nowhere near dramatic enough to cause, like, you know, the sky to fall. Um, scroll down. Cases smooth per million, mortality percentage. Comparative to other countries, Japan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, Sweden, Taiwan. Remember I told you before, look at a lot of the Asian cultural values as far as diet and things like that. That could play a huge role. Of course, where's Japan? Right there. Where's South Korea? Right there. Where's Taiwan? On the x-axis. Western countries? Let's see who is blue. Blue is Great Britain. Pink is USA. And Sweden, obviously, because people like you compare in Sweden, but that's our control. It's right there. So doing nothing equals the United States, which is doing a lot. Death per million, Sweden, down there, USA, Great Britain, our Asian friends. Oh, well, you could see it there. All right. And then we go with this, this little chart there. You can see right up there, the United States went to there and to Sweden went up to there. December, as is December 5th, it's not December 6th. Here's our death smooth per million, da, da, da. Now here's the interesting part. Look at this as far as reporting on Sweden. Now, this is why you have to sometimes smooth the chart. If you're a nef uh, nefarious reporter or journalist, look how Sweden will have a zeros for three days, then go four, then four, then zeros. If you want to report your data at the time to make the greatest amount of impact, you wait a few days and then you report on Sweden if you wanted to really knock Sweden because you're in some sort of weird psychotic rivalry. If someone's doing good and they're avoiding the virus and the pandemic, number one, send your epidemiologist over there to see what's going on and how things are working. And number two, be grateful. It's not bad for them. Don't wait for them to fall again. That's not cool. All right, and so on and so forth. Total cases per million, deaths per million. Again, our Asian friends, look at the diets, the honeysuckle, the lychee, the green tea, the glucons, taking the shoes off because of formal formation and positive coronavirus on the floor and da 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 and we'll finish it off with that so I don't keep you up too much. So what we did was we covered basically the school testing in reference to primary schools. British Medical Journal thinks it's going to be a disaster if we uh, do what we're going to do. Uh, green tea as far as being able to block a large number of the docking sites uh, in reference to SARS-CoV-2. 
then we covered uh, basically my main hypothesis and why the testing and positive cases seem to flow hand in hand because the testing sites in closed facilities, long waits, creating, I mean, if you're, I mean, think about it. If you're driving forward and the guy has his windows down and his guy is infected and coughing or whatever it is, and you drive 10 feet forward and your windows are down too, or if your windows are down, your car ventilation system, unless you have some sort of special ventilation system, is going to suck the air in from the person in front of you, just like it does diesel fumes and everything else. And basically, yeah, you're going to basically pull in whatever has been floating in the air that's maybe aerosolized or at least airborne. And then we go back to that. And then we go to our very first section. And that is the airflow. At this wonderful, wonderful breakthrough, uh, Monopur Purever, Purever, which I hope makes the news because it could save so many lives if this actually pans out. Again, we're off to our channel signing off once again. It's been a long night. It is now 12.53 at December 6th. And I look forward to see you all once again next week. And I'll see you later on. Bye-bye.